those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm uh, John Carradus. I'm one of the trustees on the New Zealand Grasslands Trust. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker uh, from the award presented last year for the Rayburn Trophy. Uh, and the Trust awards the Rayburn Trophy to a person associated with the pastoral farming industries who has made an outstanding national contribution over their working career. Their outstanding contribution would have created a legacy for the future of some relevant area of New Zealand grassland endeavour. This may have resulted in a changed approach to grassland farming and or created a greater awareness of important factors associated with grassland farming. Their efforts would have gone well beyond the expectations of their normal employment activities. And last year we awarded this to Dr Stephen Goldson and part of that uh, responsibility that he has in accepting it is to do a tour through New Zealand and talk about uh, areas of science and research uh, that are important to him. Stephen's a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, uh, a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Agriculture and Horticultural Science, and has the Order of New Zealand Merit. He's known for his pioneering and successful biological control work on three severe pests of New Zealand pastures, and that's what we're going to hear about today. During this work, Stephen was also able to conduct fundamental research into insect pest behaviour, seasonality, and damage thresholds. In general, this work has contributed significantly to biological control theory, particularly as it pertains to New Zealand's unique pasture ecosystems. Stephen has also shown leadership and inventiveness in recognising how science can address difficult biosecurity problems and worked in the use of sensor technology to detect unwanted biological material in shipping containers. During the course of his career, Stephen was Chief Science Strategist in AgriSearch. He has also contributed to many government and public good advisory committees and worked as an advisor to the Right Honourable Simon Upton and strategist Professor Sir Peter Gluckman, though I might add has not been participating in the restructuring discussions that have gone on. So we had lots of questions on that yesterday. Stephen just shared his ignorance, so I bother, I wouldn't suggest you actually ask him any questions on that at all. <laughs> Stephen um, has been well recognised uh, for his work, uh, and the most recent recognition being the winner of the 2023 Science New Zealand Supreme Lifetime Award for Scientific Contribution. So Stephen, we look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, this is, I call this getting even. This is about three uh, invasive weevil pasture pests uh, that have come into New Zealand and this is about what we have been doing about them. So I'd just like to emphasize the talk I'm given it isn't all my work by any means. And I apologize to the couple of people here who are not in this picture. It was, yeah, yeah, all right, Louise. But, <laughs> and Jessica. The, the main thing here is that there was, this work's been done by a combination of very dedicated, and I think very professional, and I think interested colleagues over the years. And this, this work that I'm talking about covers about 35 years. Uh, somebody asked, why didn't I bring the trophy? Well, there it is, and it's solid bronze, or lead, or something. Um, uh, but what I did do was read uh, and go through what David Chapman did last year in this series of talks, um, which addressed the idea of pasture productivity, are we gaining? And the conversation was about, well, there's been pasture improvement, forage improvement, selection trials, how much difference is that making in the farming environment itself? And my challenge or partial response is, well, maybe pests are holding back some of these gains. And our group, our larger group, has estimated that pests, or these, the pest damage in New Zealand is costing uh, 400 to 500 million a year. And that's referring only to the three weevil species I've been talking about. So even if it's half that, and I have no reason to believe that it is half that, but even if it is, it's still knocking back a lot of productivity and gain. 
And uh, this focus of this work is about ecologically based pest management. And I was in, away, I was in Britain a month ago, and this appeared in The Guardian. And it's uh, part of the British concern about loss of biodiversity, but also the loss of populations of insects as well. And those that know in Britain seem to attribute this decline as the result of pesticide use. And they didn't mention climate change, but I would contend that climate change has got something to do with it as well. But there's no doubt that uh, pesticides are in the crosshairs of our trading partners. And I think that partially explains the focus that we've had on, bi on uh, bi biological control. So this talks about pest management. Often pest management is called biosecurity, but it isn't. I think pest management is when we're dealing with things that are already established here and are in eradicable. Biosecurity is largely focused generally on stopping stuff getting in. So pest management is what this talks about. These pests have been here a while, as I'll explain. So there are four aims to this talk. One is I'll talk about the biological control of three exotic pasture pests using Argentine stem weevil as an exemplar. I'll talk about how New Zealand pasture ecology has affected biocontrol. And I'll talk about some of the issues we've run into on the way. Evolved pest resistance to the biocontrol agents is one. And the other is the danger of biocontrol strain hybridization. And then I'll make some reference, the fourth point, to the genetics work that we're starting to do, which I will explain combines with the ecological work we've been doing. So here are the three weevils. Uh, this is a lucerne weevil. It arrived in uh, New Zealand in the early 1980s. Argentine stem weevil and clover root weevil. I said it arrived in the early 1990s. There's a little sub-story here. Um, what happened is Alan Stewart turned up with these little packets of ryegrass seeds, which were last used in 1915, 1916, 1917, and they hadn't been opened since then. <coughs> And Alan Stewart, who works for PGG Wrightson's seed production, um, uh, brought these to me, and we had a grand opening. It's like opening to come to see what was in it. And there are a lot of seeds in it. And there are also bits of Argentine stem weevil in it, and also ryegrass seeds. The stem weevil, uh, the stem weevil population in these seeds suggests that this uh, insect was well established by the middle, well, by 1915. And some searches of remote museums suggest it probably came in about 1890. The other very interesting thing about this was that the seeds that were in it were endoph endophytic, which conventional thinking suggests that the seeds have become endophytic because of selection pressure by Argentine stem weevil. So it answered a lot of questions, they're very interesting. So, referring to the damage, uh, lucerne weevil um, mainly creates damage through under the ground, feeding on the nitrogen fixing uh, root nodules. Uh, but when they emerge, the adult weevils feed on the um, foliage. Argentine stem weevil, this is an example of uh, ravaged short rotation ryegrass caused by stem weevil. And this is clover root weevil. Now, clover root weevils like Lucerne weevil, it feeds on the roots, this is the larvae, feed on the root nodules and very much affect nitrogen fixation and then the adults themselves come out of the soil and you get this uh, folio damage. This actually is quite a mild case of what we've seen with clover root weevil. So we've got these three species doing this stuff to our pastures. So pesticides do have some use in New Zealand uh, pasture pest management still particularly uh, in conservation tillage. Um, this is an example where there was no pesticide. This is where stem weevil was drilled into a pasture in Taranaki. And the, sorry, this is yeah, the straight drilling of stem weevil. And what happened is when the uh, seedlings emerged, stem weevil just mowed them all down. So we had no production at all. So neonicotinoids are being used here variably to try to prevent that happening to seedlings. Endophyte doesn't work particularly well because there's a gap between the uh, seedling germinating and the 
and the alkaloids or whatever they are in, in the grass uh, are expressed. So given that background, but pest management in New Zealand, really we've got the options of plant resistance and or biocontrol. We can't really use pesticides. The area is far too great to cover New Zealand pasture, pasture ecosystems and the ecological damage apart from the cost would be enormous. So we have to do plant resistance or biocontrol or both together. So this talks about the biocontrol end of the thing and this is about a very small parasitoid looks big here, but it's only one, millim one millim millimeter here, but two and a half millimeters, very small, in the genus Microtonus. Microtonus is Greek for little murderer, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so what is classical biocontrol, which is what I've been talking, we'll be talking about. Well, it sounds easy. So we have a pest, so we go away and we find the enemies of that pest, which is usually where the pest came from. We bring the natural enemies in and we release them. Uh, these, these natural enemies are usually from overseas. We release them and then these natural enemies obliterate the pests with minimal damage to, on the non-target species, particularly native New Zealand species. And when it works, it's very valuable, minimum cost, low pollution, self-perpetuating. So it's a really good solution. And a lot of people think that that's the solution for our pest problems. But the reality is that only 10% of any pest management effort internationally for the last 100 years has done anything. So there's not a biocontrol solution to every problem. Yet he, here, we, what we did is we did three biocontrol programs, and each of them worked. So that's one chance in a thousand that we got the results that we have got. And I'll come back to that because it's an extraordinary thing to have happened. So we conducted very similar biocontrol programs on those three species, but I'll talk about stem weevils as an exemplar, and then we can cover off some of the other stuff. So in all cases, our pest populations in New Zealand pasture are extremely high, and this is because of lack of biotic resistance to those invasive species when they come in from wherever they're from, and and also a lack of natural enemies. So our pastures are full of nutrient host plants and there are no natural enemies. So we get these explosive numbers of pests. These, these populations we have in New Zealand are way higher than ha what happens in the native range. Some of these invasive species we have are probably taxonomic interest only in the places they come from. This is stem weevil again. And they have built up in Waikato and here to up to, to over 700 per square meter. Now the interesting thing about these is they go through four instars, four larval stages, and in the process kill three to five tillers. So that's three to five tillers times 700, which is a lot of tillers, which I won't do now, but it is a lot of tillers. And this is the damage stem weevil does. It begins its life as an egg laid in the sheath of the grass the eggs hatch, and the larvae emerge and hollow out the stems of the grass, particularly lolium, and then it leads to this type of damage. Um, I mentioned seedling damage. Seedling emergence is also affected by the adult weevil, which nips off the cotyledons. Usually adult feeding by Argentine stem weevil doesn't matter. This is an example, but it does matter in the case of seedlings. And this is a dead seedling here, and there's probably another one somewhere around here. This effect on by Argentine stem weevil on New Zealand agriculture is totally different from what goes on in the native range. This is in a place called Viga or Malines. It's an intermontane valley in Patagonia. It's cold and it's wet and it has a short growing season. I went there to try to find a parasitoid. I couldn't find the weevils, let alone a parasitoid. It's a pretty forlorn place. There are a few sheep here. So anyway, in terms of Argentine stem weevil, the species to consider is Microtonus hyperodi. This little wasp is parthenogenetic, so it's clonal. It only produces identical daughters. And because it's clonal, it has very little scope for adaptation to changes in its ecosystem or above all its host. This is its life cycle. It lays its egg inside the weevil's body in the hemocele, uh, either here 
or in the interstices between the sclerite or in its eye or in its mouth, anywhere you like. And one of the features here is this tiny little tube which the egg has to go down to get into the weevil's body. So it's tiny. So this is the egg which is floating around in the humor seal of the weevil in about four days or something. Then it develops into a first instar. And then incredibly it goes through, I think, four stages or five, we don't really know. Uh, it grows in through four stages to produce this huge instar, this pre-pupa. Now the interesting thing about this is the weevil stays alive all the way through this. <coughs> because the weevil has to feed in order to allow the parasitoid to grow. So there's a lot of uh, co-evolution here and so on. I think this picture might show this. So it's a nasty business. <laughs> and the weevil doesn't seem to notice it particularly. Sorry for that poor weevil. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it later too. Um, there's no ethics here. <laughs> and um, what's interesting to us is the, the weevil doesn't seem to notice the parasitoid. It's busy trying to only posit in its eye. You'd think it'd get some idea of something was going on. It? <laughs> so this is all the, with co-evolution. Oh, sorry, I have to watch it again. In fact, we may have to watch it for the rest of the talk. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, because we had stem weevil, because it's doing that damage, uh, uh, we started to do the biocontrol thing. And I and capable assistants went to South America twice uh, to look for a natural enemy of Argentine stem weevil or natural enemies of Argentine stem weevil. Uh, with not, there was not much to work on. 1948 CIBC or International Institute of Biocontrol made some reference to a parasitoid wasp, new species that wasn't actually identified in Uruguay, southern Uruguay, and Bariloche. Very low numbers. Uruguay is where you can see it. Bariloche is a ski resort where all the Nazis went after the war. So it's been great. Cultural differences. This picture is of me, and you can buy a signed one of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should. This, this is absolute yeah. rubbish, this photo, because we did all our work in the dark. But I just wanted to do this for the sake of posterity. <laughs> this is more like what we've done. <laughs> so what we did is we collected uh, huge populations of unknown species with a butterfly net at night hoping that stem weevil might be in the mix. And uh, my job, the job then, was to empty the net content on, on a tray and try and find stem weevil. But there's a huge population of big, hairy moth things, beetles, the, the taxonomy way beyond what I knew what I was looking at. Uh, I had to do this, and the interesting feature was that they used to find a way into the bedroom, because this is on the balcony of the bedroom. This caused consternation. And I must say, the landlords weren't very impressed either. But it's difficult to explain what we're doing, because I couldn't speak Spanish. So we just had to give us a bit of doubt. And then we set up these little lamps in the hotels. So we had a quartz halogen and torch and a microscope. The job then was, when we had found weevils in a locality, to find out if they were parasitized or not. And so the way we did that was to dissect the weevils and see if the parasite was inside them. So the way we did that, we lovingly, lovingly put them into hot wax, which stopped them wriggling around. <laughs> and then, after a period of wonder, we uh, opened them up. So this is a weevil which is in the wax. This has been opened up. The door. We've taken the wing cases off, and this is the dorsal surface. This is an, a pet. This is an ovary. Well, this is an ovary. These are ovarioles. These are where the eggs move down the tubes. And this is a spermatheca. So I can tell you that this weevil is youngish, and it's been mated, and it's female. Um, it's amazing how much information our group could get by this dissection method. We can find out all sorts of things. So this shows when it's parasitized, the sort of thing we were finding in here. So this is the first instar larva, as I mentioned. And this is the egg with the embryonic larva inside it. 
So when they were parasitized, uh, it was sometimes very obvious, uh, they quite often produce these teratocytes. Uh, the association between the uh, parasitoid and the host resulted in these things, which are a very good indicator of parasitism. Science is uncertain about what these teratocytes do. I'm told that they may have something to do with nutrition of the parasitoid, or, uh, uh, or it helps sequester food or something. I don't really know. Mark McNeil knows he's glaring at me. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Anyway, this is an example of a pre pupa that's, that's the big thing that emerges later on. So we found the microtonus ethiopoides, the parasitoid, very widely in South America at similar latitudes to New Zealand, which was great because we didn't know we were going to find anything, really. So we found that it was very widely distributed. So it's in, Porto, it's in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, Colonia in um, Uruguay, then a lot of places in Argentina, and then on the other side of the Andes, in Concepcion and La Serena. So that's a hell of a geographical range, actually. And um, in all of these places, they were where I had collected weevils and then found the parasite in them. There's lots of places where we collected the weevils and didn't find anything. So it was, you know, searching. This is just a, some comment on the sort of habitats. This is uh, uh, General Rocker uh, in the lee of the Andes, and very dry. This is uh, in um, South Brazil, Ascasubi or somewhere, and um, tro effectively tro tropical. I mean, that's a, a rice paddy. And then in these places, that Barilocci, these places that look so like Otago. So what did we do? Well. When we found um, the parasitoids that were parasitized, we knew the population was, but we didn't know how many weevils within the population were parasitized because we would have killed them to find out. So we collected a lot, and we put them in these tubes to send them to New Zealand, for them to go into quarantine. And this was in um, gentler days, because we used to put these in, which looked like little packets of cocaine. <laughs> but Today. I'm not sure, but someone might know it here. But anyway, there's no questions asked. So we used to pack this all up and put this in, in this important looking box uh, where we're asking people not to open it. So it used to go through customs unopened. They just trusted us because we had the New Zealand crest on it. And um, the key to this is that they went through via the drinks cabinet of our Aerolinus Argentinus. Uh, because they would be killed going through in the, in the hole, because the flight was at 20,000, 40,000 feet over the Antarctic. So there was, we had this associate that was a flight attendant on the Aerolinus Argentinus, and she <laughs> carried this stuff. I don't know how many boxes, a lot. And it was very helpful. It was great. And then when we got them into the quarantine, we put them in this, these little boxes to see what would drop out. And what we were looking for was to see if there was any parasitoid pupae dropping out that we could then rear. And this summarizes uh, what we did. Um, these are the places, and these are the t countries, and these are the localities, and I won't step through them all, but there was a, there was a lot. And overall, we brought in 13,500 weevils uh, that we knew were from populations that were parasitized. And we reared out the pupae that dropped out of those numbers, which led to us knowing that there's a roughly about less than 5% parasitism where we did find the weevils in South America. So it's bloody low. And this thing, parasitoid lines established, these are the parthenogenetic lines of the various females we brought in. And I'll tell you now, we couldn't tell the lines apart when the adults emerged still look saying to us. We tried some older methods for species differentiation and it was very difficult. Anyway, we spent a million dollars uh, safety testing these populations. This was just when the RNA was being introduced and uh, there was a lot of concern that what we were bringing in would attack uh, native species. In fact, the microtose hyperodin behaved very well and we were able to let it go. 
So what we did, this is why I'm talking about groups of us, we reared a million infected Argentine stem weevils because it was the infected stem weevils that we released. We couldn't release the parasite, it was too, too fragile. So we used to put out these infected Argentine stem weevils. And what we did when we were rearing these things, and it went from one generation to 90 successive generations, we took samples midstream to see if there was any uh, changes in the uh, genetics of these animals. <coughs> and we, as part of this, released very large numbers of Argentine stem weevil that were infected with the parasitoid. These big green blobs is 40 to 50,000. So we had no idea how many we should release because we didn't know anything about anything really and uh, probably in, in hindsight we could have released a hundred rather than 40,000 but we wanted to be thorough and it worked very well so this this here is the years this goes from 1991 to 1996 and this is um, percent parasitism of the weevils now these lines are the summer that these are the winter lines, rather, when everything goes into hibernation. This variation is to do with the interaction with various emerging generations and seasonal fluctuations of the ratios and so on between the weevils and the parasitoid. The, the stable periods are shown in the winter by these red lines. So this is in um, Hamilton, so 73%, 80%, 68%, down here is 73% which were good numbers, they were good high levels of parasitism. And we often got levels of 90% quite often, which is miles ahead of what we were finding in South America. And it worked, so these are, this is the effect on the populations of the weevil. So this is eggs per square meter, and this is 1991 to 1996. This is the numbers of eggs, peak numbers of eggs, peak numbers of larvae and adults per square meter. So the effect of this was to reduce, if not eliminate, the impacts of Argentine stem weevil on these pastures. This all looks like a great success, so I could stop the talk now. The approach we uh, took to lucerne weevil and clover root weevil was very similar, and they worked in the same sort of way. So as I said, we got three out of three, one in a thousand, so the scientific question remains, well, why did, the, why did the work beat the odds so well? What was going on? Why did we get such luck, really? And a clue is the New Zealand pastoral ecosystem, which is very different from elsewhere. So the nature of our pastures, which many of you will recognize by this photograph, is what somebody called a partial transplant of European meadow plants, the best being ryegrass and clover, and uh, as you all know, it's very versatile and it stands up to ruminant grazing and all the rest of it. But it's not diverse. And hence that lack of diversity, as I mentioned, le leads to these massive outbreaks. Now, the question was, well, we've got biocontrol agents in New Zealand. Why the hell aren't they doing the job? Why are we getting these build-ups when we know we've got natural enemies? Basically, the natural enemies we have are in forests, native forests, and in tussock lands, native tussock lands, and they're not in our grasslands, simply because there's 20 million years difference in the evolutionary time of these and those. So basically, the natural enemies here are not evolved to recognize the pasture ecosystems at all. And uh, also, the natural enemies here did not co-evolve with Argentine stem weevil. Or the other parts of the, or the other weevils for that matter. So there's a massive ecological and temporal separation and that's why uh, we were getting no biocontrol. The, another point is that New Zealand natural enemies don't go into pastures which is just what I've been saying. So here this is numbers of spiders per square meter and this is distance from the edge of the, of the hedgerow or whatever it is, <coughs> five meters out and they're not there at all. They just don't move into the grasslands. The European farms are completely different. Europe once was forested, this is pale Arctic, not just Europe. It was once forested, and the farms are basically holes in the forest. But the key here is that it's all one ecosystem. So the plants, the 
the pasture plants, the mango <coughs> plants, and the forests, and everything else are all one place. So therefore, <coughs> the problems that we um, have here don't happen in European ecosystems because the natural enemies can migrate across the landscape. So it's a completely different setup. So I was recently in England, and um, the farmers are now leaving these conservation strips on the sides of their, of their crops. Because there's biodiversity here, and I'm no botanist, but there is a lot of biodiversity, and therefore a lot of biodiversity of animals and insects, and all the rest is insects and natural enemies and so on. And they migrate into the crop, and it works, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. So why were the parasitoids so successful? Well, they were for exactly the same reasons that the pests thrive. The parasitoids encountered few, if any, natural enemies or competitors, so they took off in the same way as the pests. This 80% parasitism, for example, is far higher than I think ever would have occurred in evolutionary history. So we're really off the scale when it comes to the behavior and impact of these species. But I have no doubt that it's the lack, it's the predator release thing with the natural enemies that allowed them to thrive in exactly the same way as the pests. So that was a good, you know, it was a good outcome. And uh, what we did find also, though, is these biocontrol systems are unstable. So stem weevil populations acquired resistance to the parasitoid. There have been implications of parasitoid ecotype hybridization and the threat of climate change uncoupling uh, the life histories. So this uh, evolved resistance was quite controversial uh, that we see as the penalty for such focused and intense biocontrol on a species. And this is what we found. So this is percent overwintering parasitism, which you recall is a stable time. And this is years after release. And it, it was significantly declining the whole time. It was pretty stable for about the first seven years, and then down it went. It's about, uh, past about 40 generations. But this was very thorough. We did this in 196 sites across New Zealand pasture lands from 18 regions. We dissected 11,000 weevils, and it's 21 years sampling. So this is a real effect. And we believe that that effect was the result of the weevil becoming evasive when it saw the parasite. I mentioned before it was stupid, it just ignored it. We think we selected four strains of the weevil that were alert to the parasitoid. I think that the weevil, when it came in from South America, had a bit of resistance to stem weevil in its native range, so it had to deal with its natural enemies there. And it, it came over by accident here, but it still contained that capability of dealing with a range of natural enemies, including the parasitoid. And what we did is select on that small amount of resistance that was there when the weevil arrived and select by the parasitoid to make it a large part of the resistance. <coughs> there was no new genes put into it. There was no new uh, enzymes or anything. I think it was selecting an already pre-existing resistance. So what we found in, to support that is that Ruakura, uh, where there are a lot of generations of the parasitoid because it's warm, put far more selection pressure on the weevils than they did, say, to Itapri, where not much happens at all. And the selection pressure on the weevils at Ruakura caused the overwintering levels of parasitism to drop from 85, 90% to less than 12. So it was quite clear, whereas at Lincoln, it was a reduction from, say, uh, 80% to 47%. So it seems to be related to latitude, which I think is to do with selection pressure. And the real reason why this worked is because of this something known as the lopsided evolutionary arms race. The weevil can evolve because it's sexually reproducing, sorting out eels and things. The parasitoid's stuck in its rut. It can't do anything. It can't evolve to keep up with changes in the nature of the weevil population. This drew quite a lot of attention. This got into science because this is the first recorded example of natural selection defeating a biocontrol agent ever. I would contend, well, that's not altogether surprising because our pastures are rather different from any other places too. And uh, not many people have looked for it for another reason. So I'll just talk about clover root weevil and lucerne weevil biocontrol. 
and then we get into this thing, this hybridization thing. And this gets quite complicated, so I'll do it slowly. So here we have Cetona discordius, which is the lucerne weevil, and here we have Cetona obsoletus, the root weevil. Cetona discordius was well controlled by another Microtona species, Microtona epiopoides, which is sexual and it came from Morocco or places like that. And here we have the root weevil. We thought it would be great because we thought this parasitoid is already knocking around in microtonus, so it should also deal with clover root weevil. Did nothing at all. So we had to go back to the drawing board, so we went to Europe because that's where the European strain of clover root weevil came from. So there's all these places that we collected from. But what, what we did, there's a COST 318 program where the EU were looking at different clover cultivars and performances in different places. So we brought them all blower backs, which is how we sample these leaf sucking machines. So we gave away eight or ten blower backs to these groups that were working on clover. So every time they went to look at the clover agronomy, they took samples to us and sent them to us in England. We set the lab up in England because we had all the biosecurity problems in New Zealand. So we were lucky enough that the BPSRC allowed us to use their lab in England. So all of these people working on the COST program were sending us samples from all over, the, all over Europe. And this is where we were, and this is built in the 12th century, this building. So the big, the big problem was that, yeah, we found the natural enemies in Europe, and there was Microtonus epiphoides again. And we'd known that the epiphoides here on Clover Root Weaver wasn't working. And we were stuck with the same species again. It's all we could find. Bearing in mind that the one that was working against Clover Root Weaver had been from Morocco. But we just were stuck. So we had um, Cetona discoides with the Moroccan Microtonus epiphoides, Cetona obsoletus with a European uh, microtones epipoides, which is very effective. So the problem solved. We could release the European one and it would handle clover root weevil, and the Moroccan one would handle lucerne um, weevil. So the job was done and we got pressure. We'd spent quite a lot of money and people wanted to know what it was doing and when the, the industry wanted to know when we were going to fix the clover, clover root weevil. And we thought, well, yeah, we can do that. So we did one check and that was hybridizing them. So we crossed the European microtonus epipoides with the Moroccan one, and it didn't work. So what happened is the F1, F2 were not useful at all. So then we were in a position, had we released that European microtonus epipoides, which would then, which was sexual, which would then combine with the Moroccan microtonus epipoides, we'd finish up with something. We wouldn't control clover root weevil or lucerne weevil. <laughs> so, so we didn't release it. And so we were in a jam, because we spent all this money and we were getting nowhere. We tell the industry we can't do anything about clover root weevil. So release was cancelled, but then disaster was suddenly averted because Mark McNeil, specifically against my instructions, went to Ireland to find <laughs> out who his relatives were and just hung around there, so pissed off with him. Uh, he came back and claimed he'd found a pathogenetic strain of the European microtonus epipoides, which then mean that it wouldn't hybridize with the one in Lucerne. Mm -hmm. So I don't really believe him, but it, it was true, he had. And he, we, he, we, he was permitted to collect from all these places <laughs> <laughs> on his odyssey, and um, um, it's worked. Now, what, what's really interesting to me is that over here we've got England, and they're all sexual, and suddenly they're all asexual over here. You can bloody near Sea Island, perhaps a bit from, I think, from Scotland or somewhere. So why, why, why is that? What's the genetics? So we don't know the genetics, do we, Mark? No. Right. Anyway, the problem is complete success. So that's because we found a hybrid. <coughs> that we found a hybrid, or we found a parasitoid that wouldn't hybridize. So there's a question here. So we've got the European Irish parthenogenetic epipoides controlling root weevil, right? Now, this is exactly the same d d 
dimension dynamic as with Argentine stem weevil. We have a partner genetic microtose hyperodi controlling stem weevil. The stem weevil became resistant through the selection pressure. There's a good chance that clover root weevil similarly will become resistant to the parthenogenetic European microtonus, uh, European. So what I'm saying there is that the weevils in New Zealand after a long selection pressure by Ethiopia would similarly become resistant. Now that's a big deal because unlike endophyte and ryegrass, they've got no fallback position at all for clover root weevil. And if, the, if this occurs, then we've lost control of clover, clover root weevil, and there are no other resistant plants available. So it's a very serious situation. So the whole clover production is being kind of held together by that one parasitoid from Ireland. So what we've, what's happened now on, on the basis of those sorts of questions is that we've moved the work into biochemistry and, and genomics and this sort of stuff. And we've had a chance to combine the ecological work we've been talking about, which is a, quite a lot, with molecular approaches. And we think that the lessons learned that we've acquired in the simple New Zealand ecosystem applies to complex ecosystems elsewhere, like in Europe. And the overall aim, of course, is to enhance biocontrol agent impacts and stability. So the current developments we're looking at is how many lines did we actually bring in. We could have brought, feasibly brought in a whole lot of parasitoids that were all identical daughters because we had no way of separating them. Now with whole genome sequencing, we are separating them. And the other question then is, did some parasitoid lines do better than others? And if some did do better, what was the characteristics of those lines? What were the traits that made them better? And then likewise, did ecosystem matching or climate matching favor some lines over other lines, and in the same way, regional populations. It starts to tell us things about the traits and nature of biocontrol agents that actually confer value. And there's a range of um, other bits of molecular work we're doing. How stable is the parthenogenetic reproduction? So we've got 10 to 80 generations. Are they still identical, or has there been some mutation or changes? These are theoretical questions. Uh, can we induce female parasitoids to produce males so we can do selections to get resistance? The group, Dearden's group thinks that he talks blithely of small molecules, whatever they are, and says we, they've got the weevils, sorry, the parasitoids have got the ability to reproduce uh, sexually, but it's just that they're not, and why they're not is still a bit of a mystery. And then there's opportunities to change the microbial flora in the guts of these parasitoids to enhance its efficacy as well. And there's a whole lot of other things that can be done. I saw Jeff Morton looking at his watch before, so I'm going to summarize. Um, so long-term long -term teamwork with this, and it's continuing on into the realms of genetics. The outcomes have undoubtedly been valuable. The ecology of biocontrol is far more beguiling and complex than is apparent at first. But I think this combination of ecological and molecular investigation offers a lot. And I think what we're finding out in particular applies to biocontrol in broad ecosystems such as New Zealand's pastures and other systems <coughs> in other parts of the world. So I'd like to very much uh, acknowledge and be grateful for the work to, sorry, for the chance to have had, we've had to do this work with such excellent colleagues. To have made a contribution to New Zealand, New Zealand grassland pest management is what mattered most to me. And times are tough, and I hope that the work described here will reassure funders of the value of long-term risky applied science, sustaining New Zealand pastoral production while protecting the environment. Thank you very much.